Welcome aboard. Our nose is cold, our switches are safe, and I just completed a stern conversion on a Royal Canadian Air Force CC-150 Tango Polaris tanker. We're in Iraq, just northwest of Baghdad, over the Anbar province. This is an OIR sortie. We were the first launch of the day from the USS Theodore Roosevelt, and we launched about four hours ago. We have a wingman on our right wing. We're currently in starboard observation on this NATO tanker, waiting for the boom operator to clear us to pre-contact. Once cleared for pre-contact, we're gonna drift about 20 feet aft of the drogue, aligning our probe both vertically and horizontally with the tanker's drogue. Once established in pre-contact, we'll report pre-contact with the boom operator who will then clear us to contact. A little left wing dip, a little power off, and we drift aft. Once established in pre-contact, we wiggle our fingers and toes. We trim out the jet the best we can. We take a breath and then we move forward. We target about three to five knots of closure so that the probe will hit the drogue with no more than a slow walking pace. Anything faster than that could risk the drogue engaging the probe so fast that it'll send a sine wave all the way up to the mipper spot on the wingtip and then all the way back, potentially ripping the probe off the aircraft. Once established in the drogue, we'll push the drogue forward a little bit, referencing the white stripes on the black hose for a judge of distance. We'll do that until we see a green light on the mipper spot, which you can't quite make out with the camera today. Once established, we'll hold this position. But today we've got a problem. Actually, we've got two problems. The first problem you see is there's a little bit of streaming fuel around the probe of the aircraft. So you'll see me reach down on my right side and turn the right bleed off. The master caution on the jet will illuminate and I'll punch that out. And you can see the right bleed off caution that appears on the bottom left of the left EDI. The second problem we have is a little more serious. The boom operator has told us that we've got a low or a no fuel flow situation. And he's directed us to disconnect on the starboard side so that he can troubleshoot his systems. So as we back out, both my EO and I are looking at our gas, we're thinking about where our nearest divert is, and trying to figure out how much time we have on station until we need to make the decision to go somewhere else and land in the event that we can't get gas airborne. Luckily today we've got plenty of gas, it's not a huge deal, we've got at least another 10 or 15 minutes that we can hang out before we need to make the decision to go somewhere else. You can see me look over my left shoulder now, as the Super Hornet on the left wing, which is an air wing aircraft, is now done tanking and is departing high into the left. So now my wingman's on my right hand side. I'm trying to engage with the right drogue now that I've been cleared to contact and the left drogue on the left wing is now open. We're clear to contact and as I approach the drogue, I can see that the drogue is starting to move a little bit more than it was before. Not a huge deal. I'm gonna set ourselves up in a nice pre-contact about 20 feet aft to the aircraft, I'm trying to get my probe laterally and vertically lined up with the drogue so that I can make a nice run for it. However, you can see now that the drogue is starting to move around quite a bit. Now I'm getting a little bit concerned because I can see that if I make a huge play for it, it potentially hit the drogue with too much speed that the sine wave that we talked about earlier could be a factor and could potentially rip off the probe from the airplane. So I know I've got plenty of gas, I've got plenty of time, I'm not going to make a play for it, so I'm just going to hang out and see if we can find a little bit more clear air. Now unfortunately the tanker is going to make a left hand turn and you'll see that as soon as the tanker starts to turn, the drogue is going to start to move around quite a bit. Now the drogue will move around until it finds its new relative wind and then it'll start to stabilize. So I'm waiting for the drogue to relatively stabilize while it's in the turn so that I can try to engage and then hold it there before the tanker pilot rolls out. If I'm trying to engage while the tanker pilot's rolling out, that's gonna be super tough and it's not the best way to go about doing this. So I'm clear for contact. I'm hanging out behind the tanker. It's moving around. I'm just trying to find a good spot, I'm trying to wiggle my fingers and my toes, set myself up for pre-contact, make it a little play for it, a little more power. The sun's a factor and missed it. So now I'm going to pull a little bit of power. I'm going to drift aft, stabilize, stabilize, stabilize. 
wiggling my fingers and my toes and trying to push forward with just a little bit of power if I can get it it's moving nope it's not gonna work so I'm just gonna back out a little bit no big deal I'm gonna reset and wait a couple of potatoes as a technique you want to use mostly longitudinal stick or elevator and then rudder pedals as required. So the rudder pedals will move your probe from left to right when you do that yaw movement. If you use too much lateral stick, the probe will be displaced both up and to the right or down and to the right and it will move both laterally and vertically at the same time. So for those last second super small minute corrections that need to be made, it's going to be mostly just longitudinal stick or elevator and a little bit of rudder pedal. So you'll see the tanker's out of a turn now. The drogue is starting to move around a little bit more than it was before. Making a play for it, getting up close, and you see it's moving around, making me feel unsafe. I'm gonna back out. Luckily, it's a super thin basket that even if it does rub on my radome or rub on the nose of the aircraft, it's not gonna cause any serious damage. My biggest concern is that there's an AOA probe just below my fueling probe on the right-hand side really smart idea to design um, and if the uh, basket gets caught on that it's very difficult to dislodge it airborne at this point for whatever reason I start looking over my left shoulder and now that super hornet that was on the left wing is now gone I noticed that the left drogue the, the left wing drogue is not moving nearly as much as the right wing drogue is so at this point I request to move over to the port side and, in, and go to pre-contact over there Luckily, the boom operator is super cool and accommodating. They clear me a pre-contact on the left-hand side. And so now I'm over here on the left-hand side going to pre-contact, get ready to make another play for it. Same kind of business rules apply here. I'm going to set myself up about 20 feet aft, wiggle my fingers and my toes, hang out, and then try to get that three to five knots closure and lift it. Just missed it. And now I'm starting to get a little bit frustrated. I've been flying for about four hours, I'm tired, I'm hungry, I'm tactically dehydrated, and now I'm having a little bit of a hard time as the tanker goes in a left-hand turn here now, trying to find that clear air that we were in before. Not necessarily clear air, but the air that wasn't quite as choppy as this stuff is, because now even the tanker pilot can feel that the jet's kind of, that his aircraft is kind of jumping around a little bit. Not a big deal, I still have about another 10 or 15 minutes on station before I can, before I need to make the decision to divert. So I'm just hanging out, trying to go back to pre-contact, wiggle my fingers and my toes, stabilize a little bit of power, not quite looking good. I'm gonna back out just a little bit. Hang on, back out a little bit. Same kind of rules apply here, there's pre-contact. I'm gonna wait for it to stabilize and try to push it up. Not going too fast to potentially damage the aircraft, but just trying to get it in there. Okay, here we go. Nice solid pre-contact position. We'll start to push it forward. As soon as the tanker pilot rolls out, he rolls out. And as soon as he changes his lift vector positioning, you see that the drogue moves a little bit. It'll find that new relative wind. It'll stabilize. Looks like he's going back a little bit to the right now for whatever reason. The drogue is stabilizing-ish. Moving around a bit, not moving around crazy. It's super doable. Let's see, pushing it up. Not quite enough power, pushing it up, pushing it up, pushing it up, and ah, got it. Okay, no sine wave, good to go. You can see the white stripe near the mipper spot at the very end. I'm gonna push that up just a little tiny bit. Now I'm gonna hold it. Look over my right side, and now they're clearing my wingman to try to engage the right drogue on the right-hand side of the air. So I'm in, I'm good, relaxing, breathing, looking down on my uh, EFD, the bottom left corner, making sure that we're getting gas, and we are. The fuel page looks good, we're taking gas, everything's good, tanker's rolling out, and now I'm just gonna hold this position. So the most important thing is that we don't let the brogue disengage from the drogue. And the biggest thing that's gonna cause that is if we back out. So we're gonna look at the hose, and at the very end we talked about how there's stripes on it, midway up and at the very end of the hose there's a stripe that's close to the mipper's pod. The mipper's pod is a refueling pod that's on the aircraft wing and we call it MIPRS, M-P-R-S is the acronym I think, but it's a multi-point refueling system. Now we look at the white stripe closest to the mipper's pod and once we have that green light and we're getting good fuel flow, that distance between the white stripe and the mipper's pod is what we want to hold. 
So I'm just looking at the hose, making sure that it's not laterally getting stretched out to the right or to the left, and making sure that that distance from the white stripe closest to the mipper spot is being maintained throughout the evolution. Now when the tanker goes in a turn, there's a little bit of skill involved here. The way I look at it is the tanker's wings are my new horizon. And I, make, I try to get my wings to match that new horizon. So if the tanker rolls up on a little bit of a right hand turn, which looks like he's doing here just to avoid weather, I'm just gonna roll with the tanker and make the tanker's wings look like the new horizon. And then he rolls back to the left, I'm gonna do the same thing. You kind of, over time, figure out a way to make this happen subconsciously. In this case, looks like he's rolling back to the left a little bit. Holding it, holding it, not a big deal. Just wiggling my fingers, fingers and my toes, just relaxing not a big deal and just making sure that hose stays nice and straight making sure that I'm not accidentally backing out maintaining that distance and just using the tanker's wings as my new horizon now a couple things to think about so we're in an EA 18G which is basically an electronic attack version of an FA 18 Foxtrot from a systems perspective it's the same airplane from a NATOPS studying perspective, we actually have the same NATOPS manual. It's exactly the same. However, in the Growler, there's a few things that have been modified to make it an electronic attack version of the FA-18 that make it unique. A Growler, for instance, doesn't have a gun. So in the gun bay in the nose, where the gun would be on an F-18 Echo or Foxtrot, we're gonna have a gigantic computer. It's a supercomputer called the EAU, or the Electronic Attack Unit. It's a big computer that manages the electronic systems on the aircraft, specifically the ALQ-218 wingtip receiver pods that we have. There's some other receivers on the aircraft as well. And the ALQ-99 tactical jamming pods that we have on the airplane. The Growler's mission is to detect and identify airborne signals, and when appropriate, to put TRONS downrange to those signals in order to deny, disrupt, or confuse the enemy who's using those signals to enhance her own situational awareness. The Growler can carry a lot of gas. It's fitted with four internal wing tanks, tanks one, two, three, and four, and two internal wing tanks, the left wing tank and the right wing tank. Tanks two and three are engine feed tanks, while tanks one and four and the wing tanks are transfer tanks. Internally, the Growler can carry around 14,000 pounds of gas. In this combat configuration, however, we're carrying three by ALQ-99 jamming pods, two by external fuel tanks, an Argum missile, and an AIM-120 missile as well. So we've got two additional fuel tanks on board. Each fuel tank is about 480 gallons or an additional 3.2 thousand pounds of gas. So quick math, Around 13.9 plus 6.4 is around 20.3 thousand pounds of gas that we can carry on board. As far as refueling goes and speeds of refueling go, the Growler can only take gas up to around 55 PSI, which is going to limit the amount of gas that we can take quickly. Realistically, the Growler can take about a thousand pounds a minute, and as the Growler gets closer to getting full, as its tanks get closer to being full, rather, then the amount of gas they can take at any given time is closer to about 800 pounds a minute or so. So in this case, looking at our EFD, it looks like our internal tanks, as we started tanking, are almost full. The external tanks are empty. So in this case, we're probably looking at taking around seven to 8,000 pounds. It's gonna take us about seven or eight minutes on the hose. A lot of my viewers have asked about my helmet. I think now is a good time to break it down. So my helmet has evolved over the years. For a fighter pilot, or in my case, a growler pilot, it's common to get your helmet changed or the decals on your helmet changed every time you show up to a new squadron. Now, Navy regulations say that your helmet has to be at least 75% white. So the helmet, people think there's cracks in it, but there's actually not any cracks at all in my helmet. What it is, it's a it's a hard helmet, it looks a lot like a motorcycle helmet, and the outside is covered with strips, consecutive strips of white reflective tape. My helmet's got a couple things on it. 
at this time, and it's since changed if you've seen my newer T45 videos. At the time, I had the uh, lightning bolts on from when I was a yellow jacket in VAQ 138, and you'll see those on the top. On the back, you'll see my call sign pale. You'll see the Cougar kind of above pale, and on the right-hand side, the Cougar was when I was flying on this tour in CAG staff. I was flying with the VAQ squadron, VAQ 139. They were the Cougars, and they put that logo on my helmet. I was proud to fly with it. And then last, the big rainbow eagle is associated with CAG-17. I was the CAG-17 ELO, or Electronic Warfare Officer, during this cruise. So my job was to be on CAG, or the commander of the Air Group's staff, and be able to answer any questions that he or the DCAG had about anything electronic attack. And in addition to that, my job was to liaise with the VAQ squadron and make sure that which in this case was VAQ-139, make sure that their needs were met and that I worked very closely with their operations officer to make sure that they were taken care of. A funny story about the patch or the logo for CAG-17. I was watching Top Gun Maverick with my kids recently and I noticed at the very beginning of the movie around time 0403 when Maverick opens his locker in his hangar bay He'll reach in to grab his jacket, and you'll see a CAG-17 patch, exactly the same logo that's on the back of my helmet in his locker. Bonafide legit. Anyway, let's take a sec here to talk about the disconnect or the disengagement procedures from the tanker. When we're satisfied, we're going to let the boom operator know that we're offload complete, and we're going to request disconnect. Once we're cleared to disconnect, all we're going to do is we're going to try to leave the drug where we found it, is the way I like to say it, which means we're going to make sure that the, the hose is stretched nice and straight, that we're not offset to the right or to the left laterally, and we're going to go down just a little tiny bit so that when we slowly pull away, the drug doesn't have an immediate response to go in one direction or the other due to the relative wind and potentially smack, damage the aircraft, or get stuck on the AO probe like we talked about before. So when it's time, we're going to go down just a little bit, we're going to pull a little bit of power, and we're going to slowly back away. So now it's time to disconnect. We pull a little bit of power and creep back at a walking pace, careful not to let the drogue impact the radome of the aircraft. As we work our way back, we put our probe back in, we take a little check to the right, and work well behind the tanker and our wingman into starboard observation. Well guys, it's been a long day. We still have two more hours of on-station time before we can work our way back to the Northern Arabian Gulf for our recovery. I hope you enjoyed the ride along. If you enjoyed the jam, please like, comment, and subscribe. Buy me a beer if you'd like. The details are in the description. Thanks for all the beers up to this point. I appreciate your continued support for this channel. Welcome aboard Growler Jams.